In a socially distanced world, Design United is an optimistic digital platform for collaborative design and connection. Design United was created in March 2020 during a period of intense lockdown and quarantine measures within the region. The aim behind Design United was to create an optimistic space for regional dialogue, connections, collaborations, and opportunities for young regional designers and design practices. A much needed network of support and peer mentorship during these uncertain times. Talented young designers and design studios working on design innovation with an approach that is relevant to our South Asian region have been invited to be a part of the platform. We also encourage design students from the region to share their work, be involved in the dialogue, and to be an active part of Design United. Design United, most of all, believes in creating a community of designers and design knowledge that is largely contextual with focus on contributing to the environment and our community. Design United believes greatly in a spirit of collaboration and idea exchange. Good evening. In a socially distanced world, Design United is an optimistic digital platform for collaborative design and connection, showcasing emerging talent and a curated selection of design from our own region. Welcome to Design United's first design conversation in a new series of weekly conversations with both emerging as well as established designers, unique practices with their inspiring stories. The aim of this series is to engage in conversations with talented practices and to understand their design approach. I'm Varna Shashidar, a landscape architect and founder principal of a regional practice VSLA based in Bengaluru. I'm supported by Claywork Spaces and my own team in this endeavor. Hope you will draw inspiration from and be rejuvenated by these presentations and conversations. So please join us every Friday. Today, it's indeed a delight to welcome our opening speakers of the series, architect Preeti Ramdurai and her partner, architect Karthik from Chennai, whose young practice, Bogar Studio, was established in 2015 and is in spotlight in our feature today. Bogar Studio's work has a freshness and an experimental quest towards design and making. So let's join them today in their design journey. We will be opening this up for questions post the presentation. So please do share your questions through the chat box. So let's start Bogar Studio and immerse ourselves in your work. Hi guys, uh, this is Preeti from Bogar Studio. First of all, thanks Varna for thinking of us uh, to start your series with. We really excited. Yeah today and the upcoming Fridays to see the speakers are going to be a fun way to sort of spend lockdown I think. The first project that we're going to start with is Art Lab. Art Lab is a company that was actually co-founded by my partner Karthik and it's an art company that does commissioned artwork in graffitis and things like that. Uh, and this was also our first project uh, together as a studio. So the studio is actually a terrace studio, which was built over an existing building. It's on the third floor of an existing building uh, in a neighborhood, which is quite densely residential, has a bunch of small trade shops and also has a temple in its vicinity. It's mainly occupied by artists, designers and architects as well. Now. So you can see on the left, this was our site. This was our terrace. It had one room and we sort of built on this. Uh, let me just quickly run over the plan. So, uh, it predominantly consists of four different sort of studio spaces. The idea was also to sort of break out of the typical office setup and see you know, what can really work for us. Uh, so, you enter like this. There is a courtyard right at the entrance, surrounded by four different kind of studio spaces. Uh, this is, and all the four have a different function to it and different heights and things like that. This is a 14 feet studio, which is predominantly used only for painting. Uh, the north is this side. So this room has only openings on the east and 
start only at about five feet so that when you're climbing on top, you don't really see what's happening inside. This is the exit room that was there that we sort of broke open and added a pantry here. Um, this is the deck area, which is semi-open where all of our dirty carpentry, spray painting, model making, all of those sort of experiments happen here. This is another studio which is eight feet height. It's the eight feet studio where a lot of people who have work typically on their computers and laptops work here. This is purposefully made into a slightly darker space to aid computer work. But we also have these foldable uh, folding doors which sort of open into the deck area with stream and light whenever needed. This is the last room which sort of doubles up as a conference room, meeting room of sorts. We have a folding door that sort of separates between these two rooms, which can be kept open if you want to sort of use this whole space as well. Um, and some of our drawings. So the structure which, uh, sort of falls on an existing building was made very light. It's made of steel. Um, five inch box, yes. Five inch box sections. Uh, the walls are all aerocon four inch. And then the roof is actually precast panel, which is only two inches. So if you see this entrance courtyard, these benches that you see, these are uh, the precast roofing slabs that we used, which have a thickness of about two inch and the height is about three and a half inches. So we typically made sure that the structure was sort of light. Um, this is the 14 feet space with the openings that start only at about five and a half feet, which allow a lot of east morning light to come, but the light sort of goes away by mid morning, but yeah, yeah, the light in this room till about six. Most of the spaces in the studio are naturally lit till about 6 p.m. So we don't really switch on the lights unless we're working late. Um, yeah, so this is the 14 feet studio, the courtyard, this 14 feet studio in the night. So another fun thing that we as an office love to do is to like see the moon every day. And a lot of astronomical activities happen in the courtyard and this space. We sort of track the moon. Uh, this is your nine feet studio. This is the uh, folding panel that sub separates the eight feet and the nine feet. So all of these pictures were taken immediately after construction. It obviously like has a lot of furniture and it's quite messy now. I want to show you some pictures present. Uh, so this is the nine feet studio at about 4 p.m. where you get like this streak of light that falls in through this ventilator that is kept between this eight feet and nine feet height. Uh, this is Karthik working on a really large canvas in the 14 feet studio. Uh, this was one of our early days when we hadn't really finished our cabinetries and added handles and things like that. Because we find it very difficult to like find nice enough handles to put. Uh, this is another painting happening. This is one of our very important pivotal members. This is Patani, our cat. He pretty much controls the show. Uh, this is now, recently, when uh, a lot more furniture and all of our canvases are sort of... This is the painting studio. So, once canvases are done, we sort of keep them on display in this room. And once it's sort of, we're sort of bored looking at it, it sort of goes up into the loft. Uh, this is our deck area, uh, where all the dirty work happens, carpentry and spray painting and things like that. These are the folding doors I was talking about. So, when you're not really working on the computer and you want to see some like visually comforting things, you sort of open this up and work on models and things like that. This is your view, eight feet and nine feet. This is your entrance courtyard. So we use it to like do all kinds of dyeing experiments with cloth and shibori and whatnot. These are some of the products we made while we were building the studio. We had a lot of time in our hands. So if you see like the doors and windows of the studio were also like completely done on site. Uh, the handles, the hinges, the pivots, everything was done custom made on site and worked upon on site. This is some of the furniture that we did for the studio as well. Uh, so, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we were finding it very difficult to sort of like finish the cabinetry and like find good handles and ironmongery and things like that. So, we decided why not just make it ourselves. So, that led us to making it. Uh, like a completely different sort of a brand itself, which we call it, which we call Studio Made. So in this, we sort of make brand products, handles and knobs and things like that. Uh, this actually we started because we wanted uh, 
hand is enough for our own projects, but now a lot of architects seem to prefer buying things like this. This is some of our products under Studio Made. Some totems and uh, door knobs and different kind of handles and hatches and stuff. Um, the other thing that we're really fascinated by are doors. So the first, like really tall doors. So the first super tall door that we did was the door for our 14 feet uh, studio. So this is the first sort of pivot door that we tried of this height. So 14 feet by four feet. It's made with T sections of steel. And about four feet from the uh, ground, you just have concrete and about that it's wood. This wood is again reclaimed wood, 80 to 100 year old Kalima Rida that we got from Pondicherry. And the thing about this door is the entire locking system, it's all concealed within this whole steel framework. This door, I think, weighs about 350 kilos. And uh, the pivot was actually done on site because there's no way you could carry like, you know, like a finished frame up uh, third floor and things like that. The second door in the middle is an 18 feet door that we did in Cafe KP in uh, Coimbatore. I'm just going to quickly show you some. So this is a, like a very uh, simplified drawing of this door. Uh, you've got your T-sections, your central T-sections with cement below and like plywood and wood on top. And your pivot sort of comes here. So this is us experimenting with a pivot on site during construction. So this is a simple cup and pin sort of pivot that was made on site and put in here. The issue with this door is now that there's uh, some amount of friction in this pivot. So this is something we had to work on uh, in our future projects. So we started experimenting with the kind of pivots that we can do. Uh, so the next door that I showed you, Cake B, this actually worked pretty well because we basically inserted a bearing inside the pivot and that sort of fixed the issue. So we kind of also like learn along the way doing all of these experiments. So this door, this door actually moved, uh, this had actually a thrust uh, bearing. So this moved like super easily because of which we had to do a door closer. So the other, there was another door after this that we did in Bangalore where we used a ball bearing, like works brilliantly well. Uh, another part of our studio is like we started doing some more of artwork and things like that. This was because, so this door is one massive door and the, this is what you see is the inside view from the room. So you have like this massive space behind the door and we were for a very long time thinking how we should fill this up. We were thinking maybe we do wooden beading, plywood, cloth and things like that. And finally we decided this was also about time when we were kind of sick of like trying to finish the studio and really want to do something fun. So we thought why not like divide the whole door into like smaller sections and try these miniature architecture inspired models of like very whimsical spaces that you really can't build in reality. So that's how uh, the architecture inspired artwork series started. So this is some of the artwork we're working on now, 3D artwork, mixed media using MDF and gold foil of like different architecture scenes that sort of come up in our head, like very dreamy, whimsical things that, you know, we wanted to try. So yeah, this is some of that. So we started doing that and we decided maybe we should uh, take this concept forward and like do it in a different medium, like try it with metals and try 3D and things like that. So this, we're experimenting now with sand casting with brass. Uh, similar like smaller architectural monuments and scenes. Uh, maybe you can use it as paperweights or just as bedside sculptures and things like that. Uh, more architectural paintings. Again, the same sort of architectural scenes. We thought maybe how it would look if we do it on cloth. So we start experimenting with uh, block prints on mull fabric and Jaipur cotton. Um, again, what happens if you make it two dimensional, you know, almost like an elevation, but you know, what if you do it like a painting? So this, these are some of the things we're working on currently as well. The other thing that we make is furniture. Uh, this also started with building the studio and like trying to really customize furniture for ourselves. A lot of us in the studio prefer sitting cross-legged actually. We don't like sitting on the regular chairs. And there was literally nothing that we found in the market which is both affordable and something we like so we were like why not just start making our own furniture so this is called the cc bench the crisscross bench uh, most of us in the studio use this it's very 
because we like sitting cross leg with like minimum sort of back support you keep your back straight um yeah this is a lounge chair that we did again for the studio but i think this was commissioned by a bunch of people later as well so finally the 14 feet studio got a table uh we did this 11 feet by 3 feet we a really long table again with reclaimed wood the darker sections of the table that you see are rosewood the rest is all burma teak the shinier part of the table are copper plates and the sort of divisions and patterns is enhanced by brass and glaze this entire 11 feet by 3 feet table is supported by a bunch of uh, 14 mm 12 mm steel rods uh this is when we just finished polishing it with tang oil linsey oil sorry this was when we were we just made it and gotten it into the room uh this is typically how it looks on a day when we need to display things there's somebody coming to like have a look at our products and things like that the entire table gets covered and we thought initially 11 feet is a bit extra you know why do you need such a big table but it's all getting covered now so like it's a good thing this is some of the cement tiles that we're experimenting with now um some more tables this is what we use in the 8 feet and 9 feet studio the table we did for a project the cafe in concord a lot of leftover wood so we started making toys now which is kind of fun so we take a break and soon play with the uh, interesting toys now now this is the next project uh, called quarter house in bangalore um this was built for uh, so this family had two kids who were not happy with the amount of space they had they had to share a room so the parents were like we need to give them some more space so this was again built on the terrace of an existing house um it it has two levels and it can be used for like sleeping or you know as a study room uh the entire project mainly done with like three materials It's very robust looking the roof is shuttered exposed concrete the walls and floors are cement plastered and the doors are and windows are wood so this is this is white feet and the neighboring hoodie junction i think so a lot of the neighboring plots are all empty and barren and have a lot of green and it is in foreseeable future it is still going to look like that and bangalore has like very ideal climate which really let us open up a lot of these walls into like vast windows uh and doors so in a way we could achieve a lot of contrast in this building by just using these three materials like wood glass cement um yeah so uh, majorly we used three kinds of door windows one with the lower shutters which were used where we needed privacy then there were some sliding uh sliding and fixed shutters that we could use and some were casement yeah and we use like wood to sort of cover up the sockets and like enhance the lighting this is a residence in bangalore that we take during house warming with like polum on the cement floor so this was the other door that i was talking about which has the ball bearing uh which actually works pretty well now so this is a lab that we did in chennai a research lab we just did the reception building uh, entirely done in steel uh the false ceiling that you see is also steel um So this was meant to be just like a st steel skin, and and we were gonna go grow like plants here, so that the plants sort of take over the entire structure. So that when you see from the road, you just see like a green box during the day, and during the night, if it's lit up, you see like a light box. So this is how it looks now with all the plants that have sort of uh, grown all over the steel framework, and this is a view from the outside. Uh, this is actually taken last year, so it's much denser now. the cafe that we did um uh, in Coimbatore uh so we typically like to add some of these brass detailing that the studio really likes working on uh in all of us in all of our projects like some sort of steel and brass just working with like raw and this is the cafe we did for the same client in Chennai So this was an already existing house, a very typical, you know, one of those uh, 80s bungalows. Um, 
which had like a lot of internal walls. We sort of broke all of them down into like one major seating and then an L-shaped veranda all around it, which again became the thing. Um, so the fun thing about the biggest takeaway in this project was the existing house had like very questionable marble floors. And uh, I mean, those would have, so the client really didn't want to take it off because he was taking this place on a lease and he was like, I really can't change the entire flooring. We have to work with this marble. So we thought, why not uh, uh, try and like cut all of this marble floor into some interesting patterns and then fill all the gaps with cement. So we get like a very interesting cement and marble sort of a flow. So that's what we ended up with, which we thought was quite interesting. Even here, all the handles and all were done by the studio. So this is a construction. This is how this is what we did. So this was the existing marble flow. We sort of, I mean, it's quite a rigorous task, but I think the we're quite happy with the outcome. Uh, this is outdoor smoking area seating, ground floor outdoor seating. Some more pictures of the. Yeah. This is the last project. Um, so this is a farm that we are currently working on in Karikudi, in a place called Sakota near Karikudi. Um, it's about a 5,000 square feet project, but the built is probably half of that. Um, so this is the north. You can enter from here, you can enter from here, two entrances primarily. Uh, this is a kitchen store. You have a semi-open dining and you have uh, open dining with a really long dining table, a courtyard, and a study. You have one block, the north bedroom block, which has compressible living space, a toilet, a closet, and a bedroom, and its own sit-out area. The south bedroom block, which you enter like this, you have the bedroom, the reading room, and its own sit-out, and the toilet for it. All of it surrounded by this massive courtyard. A common toilet, a basement that uh, opens to like a semi-basement area and a tank on top. So in this project, we experimented mostly with uh, brick and color. So we wanted to do an exposed brick. I mean, we were going to do an exposed brick building and but we wanted to see how we can make it a little different. We didn't typically want to use the standard three inch bricks. We didn't want to see like three inch lines. We thought what if we reduce that three inch? Would that make the building taller? Like, how do we do this? So we, in this project, we made our own bricks. We made a couple of sizes. We made a 12 inch by six inch brick, which is two inches thick. Then we made an eight inch by three inch, which is two inches thick. And apart from that, we used the standard brick size as well. And we, in some areas, we used uh, something called the Kandi color. That, that's what it's called locally. Uh, that's about six inches by three inches by three quarter of an inch. Um, and also we experimented a lot with the sort of cement oxide colors that we can do, like whites and like basil greens and beiges. This is also like a takeaway from our KB project where we all of these kadapa inlays sort of coming in, in between the cement. This is also kadapa in between cement. This is a mosaic inlay. Um, this is one of the entrances and the really long uh, dining table. Uh, that's the out semi-open dining table and this is the kitchen. This is the courtyard. Uh, so all the doors and windows are again in steel. Most of the doors have cement till about sill height and then glass above it. They sit out from the south bedroom. This is the basement that opens to this area. It can be used, you know, for events and things like that. These are all the color samples that we did on site before finalizing. Actually, not even all. This is probably a quarter of the color samples that we did uh, before finalizing these colors. So once we did the... So this, this is the 12-inch by 6-inch uh, brick that I was talking about that we were making. Uh, experimenting with the kind of brick courses that we can do with this size of brick. Uh, playing with all the different brick sizes that were available in the end for pathways and things like that. So this is the six by three Kandi color. This is the regular brick. Um, so once we did this 12 by three, we decided that, okay, let's try and give it for testing and see what, how the results come up. So generally your regular standard bricks, your A grade, B grade, and C grade bricks, the compressive strength 
currently is about 14 for A grade, for B grade, I think 8 to 10 is acceptable and for C it's about even as low as 3 or 4. But with this 12 by 6, the compressive strength on an average we could achieve of about 20 uh, Newton per mm squared, which uh, you know, as an instruction engineer was like not bad. Initially, it was like very wary of us trying to uh, make our own construction material, but then I think this was fun. So this was another experiment that we had a lot of fun with. Um, yeah, that's about it. So I think uh, we called our presentation studio experiments because uh, the way we sort of work or create work for ourselves is you know, when we sort of come up with, when we see that there is uh, something in the market that we don't like and we can't find a solution for a problem, we try and do things in-house. Uh, that leads to a lot of experimenting and trial and errors and improvising. And the other thing is we pretty much uh, try and do everything, you know, like any fun thing that we see as an opportunity to experiment, like with terms of artwork or creating these, you know, sand cast with paperweights. Um, so these are the two sort of ways we sort of try and create work. So yeah, that's kind of the end of the presentation. Thank you so much, Preeti, for sharing your wonderful work with us. So uh, we will be opening the session up for questions and conversations now. So listeners can please share their questions for Preeti and Karthik through um, chat box. So um, I'm going to start off this uh, conversation as we take in listeners' questions, um, Preeti and Karthik. Yes. Karthik, you're also here. Yeah, hi. Yeah, yeah. Hi, hi, Karthik. Yeah, hi. yeah. Karthik, so, I think uh, you should talk now. Just yeah, yeah. <laughs> Both of you can talk. <laughs> so I think I will start uh, um, by asking you uh, if you could talk a little bit about the structure of your practice and how does collaboration work in your practice? Uh, uh, it is not a very structured practice till now. We are like, trying to get some structure to it now because um, before it was just a few of us uh, who like, uh, it was just me, Preeti and, and my brother and all that, where we like know them very well. So there was no need of a structure and all that. Now there are a few more people working along. Uh, so it it can't be as random as it was. So there's a there's like but but like still it's it's a like pretty small team. So uh, there's not too much structure to it, but we are, we are trying to get some structure in, in place as it, as things go forward. Um, what is it you ask? Structure. I asked you how do you collaborate? I mean between y'all and with the rest of the practice, how does collaboration work? Because, because it's a multidisciplinary practice, right? So basically, uh, each of us have like a whole list of things that we want to do, whether it's okay. artwork or furniture or graphics or illustrations or animation and things like that. So every time uh, we come across a person around us who can help us sort of do this, we sort of immediately get in touch and see how we can work. Even with like, uh, when we receive portfolios with interns or architects, we're constantly mm -hmm. looking for any way anybody can help us. <laughs> so, uh, anytime we see a portfolio that has a certain skill that can help us sort of take things off our list of things to do, we immediately sort of get in touch. I think that's how our team also has kind of expanded. Uh, okay. While looking for people who can basically help us take things up our list. You know, we want to do this, we want to do that, who can, who is good at it and how do we get them to want to work with us. And then also mainly they should be willing to experiment and not something very, yeah. very strict, uh, like, okay. like this is uh, where there's a uh, very strict direction. Mostly there'll be like no direction. Uh, <laughs> and they should be able to like, they're just working for the fun of doing it. Mm. Uh, yeah. After that, so slowly, how, maybe we get some direction to where we should go. How did you actually... Of, sorry, sorry, go ahead. Sorry. No, because most of the new things that we sort of get into, 
we really just start from scratch because we're not like qualified or educated for it. So there's a lot of trial and error, finding the right vendors, going around. Uh, so we actually learn from the people we're collaborating with as well. So that's another thing. Yes, yes. Okay. So can you talk? Yeah. Can you can you talk uh, about? Um, you know, how you started Bogar? How did you come together? I know both of you have worked in Sri Lanka, Preeti, you with Amila Dimel and Karthik with uh, Pradeep and Janishi. So what was the experience like and how has working with them been influential to your own practice? And how did you go about setting up Bogar? Can you talk a little bit about that? So, um, uh, so Sri Lanka for me was a huge huge opportunity. Um, the thing with Sri Lanka and what I really took, the big takeaway from Sri Lanka was uh, the kind of modernism that you see in India is very, very uh, different, like the kind of modernism that we were exposed to in college, uh, mm -hmm. you know, in India and in Bangladesh was something that people from abroad came and told us how to build and said, this is modernism. But in Sri Lanka, it was mm -hmm. like the first time I saw it was completely different with Minet's work mm -hmm. or with Bava's work. It was so spectacular, yeah. and and these were the kind of elements that I always liked in architecture, like the tropical elements, right? You go to like using materials which are locally available and local labor and things like that. And mm -hmm. the first time in Sri Lanka, I sort of saw it all come together in mm -hmm. a brilliant, beautiful way, even with Amla's practice. Mm -hmm. uh, so my biggest learning in Sri Lanka was before this, even my aesthetics was sort of inclined to that, but it was mm -hmm. not. It was, it was not really coming together. Uh, but Sri Lanka really helped me see these elements and how you sort of go around with it and understand how you can use the vernacular and the traditional in modernism. Mm -hmm. so for me, Sri Lanka really helped with that a mm -hmm. lot. Mm -hmm. So just let me it all come together. Over, mm -hmm. I think, right after Sri Lanka, when I came back to India, mm -hmm. I was not very keen on practicing with like under another firm. Uh, that mm -hmm. I was just finishing his residency, the scholarship in Kanoria. And we were thinking of building the art lab space. Mm -hmm. And that's how we sort of started. Uh, we were like, let's just do it together. Because I think from college, we've uh, sort of had like similar wavelengths. So we decided let's start. We weren't really thinking of like do, uh, establishing a firm then. We were just like, let's just do this mm -hmm. and see. And once we started that, we were like, let's just come together. So, Kind of easy with it. Karthik, do you want to add something? Yeah, um, for me, when I was working with Cody, it was, uh, I didn't work in Sri Lanka. He had a project in India and he didn't have anybody here to take care of the project. So I was uh, I, uh, I was kind of taking care of the project, and then uh, that 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 project was in uh, Kumaon. So uh, for me, it was I like the hills, mountains, and all that. So it it was like a fun thing for me to just go spend time there uh, because you, you uh, site visits and all uh, were. Mm, would be like for 15 days, 10 days or that, because it was like a very, very remote place. You, there's not too much connectivity. Yeah. So uh, what we do uh -huh. is we like make all the drawings here. They're all sent and we like discuss it over phone here. And then I just go to site and check. Uh, and then it, it was like local labor there who, who don't understand too much of the drawing and all that. So basically I just go there to site and mark and, and, and get, get things done there. So that that yeah, that's how I worked with them, which is which was fun for me more um, because that was once you go to site, you are also completely shut out. Nobody can like reach you or anything mm -hmm. like that. You just have to be with the guys who are there. So the site people only cook for me and all that also. So it was it was kind of fun like that. <laughs> I see. Very nice. I think uh, I think we should just open this out more to audience questions. Uh, Simran and Sanjana, can you call it? Can you do you want to step in and um, reach out to Preeti and Karthik with the questions that we've received? Uh, 
Uh, I think one of the questions we've received uh, from Ekta is, your work is, yeah. uh, first of all, amazing. And your work is very based in exploring building crafts and skill. The scale of some of your projects remind me of Frank Lloyd Wright's work. Do you identify what are your influences? Kaldik? <laughs> That's a tough question. <laughs> uh, not really Frank Lloyd Wright. I don't know. Uh, uh, I'm not sure if it's Frank Lloyd Wright. If, if it is, it's great. Um, uh, first of all, thank you, Ekta. Uh, the, I think some of the common inspirations for both of us have been uh, works of Scarpa, Barragan, Bava, uh, furniture designers like Nakashima, Finju, like Paul Kramer, uh, Bruno Manali, Arjun Jansen, you know, some of them. Um, craft, I think it's... Uh, yeah, I sort of get the whole craft angle to it because we uh, all of the things that we do with product design, furniture, art, and architecture, we uh, get in. We try and get into all of the details, and we, in a way, I guess, look at architecture also as craft. Um, maybe like a larger sculpture or something like that. I don't know. Uh, so there is a lot of crafting involved in terms of detailing out even uh, let's say the hinges or the handles uh, even our flooring layouts generally we try it uh, we get take our inspiration from not just architecture we take our inspiration from paintings and yeah. culture and things like that so from i think like that's where fields. yeah and then also like we mm, we like kind of like doing things with the hands as as like a studio yeah. itself so, uh, because once we do something with a hand in the studio, we want to like see if that can be uh, worked on on a bigger scale also. Where is like, yeah, yeah, a little bit like craft. We want to do it. So before going to Sri Lanka, I did. I spent some time with a carpenter, uh, uh, a furniture designer called Deepak Chakrapa, where I learned carpentry for over a year. And Karthik has always been doing things with hand ever since that. Moment. So I think that uh, with Deepak was my first tryst with design uh, where we made like a recliner which took about seven months to make it. Um, so it was fun to like do design at a product like at that scale level and be able to control it. And then that's when it feels like craft. And then when you sort of apply the same parameters to a larger scale like architecture, then you see where to include a uh, craft in it. You know, if you want to really look at it as a product. So I think that's where that sort of thinking might have come about. But we're aiming at this. We are aiming at trying to look at architectural like craft. That's our ongoing uh, aim, I guess. Thanks. I think Shritija sends in a question. She says, are there any ongoing experiments you can share? Anything you're looking forward to trying out? Share to an author. Uh, but I don't have pictures currently. But uh, we're making some cement tiles, um, which we have to give for testing soon. And we are currently actually working on this architecture series of paintings. Because that currently for us sounds like a lot of fun because these are kind of volumes that nobody's going to let us build. Nobody's going to let us build a series of arch that's going to lead you to nowhere and things like that. So very excited about that mainly. Um, I think in studio made front, Karthik, what are we doing? Studio made, we are like trying to um, make like door handles and uh, all that, uh, where we just kind of break away from from the regular uh, look of a door handle and how how you like engage with the handle and what you see, uh, and then. Mostly making, uh, we're not doing design um, for the fanciness of it there. Uh, there we like mainly do a handle because we have existing handles and we find some problem in that and we want to fix that problem. So it is more uh, utility oriented where you, and then the design also comes in. But, but like primarily 
what some problem that you want to fix, we 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 design the handle for that. Handles and knobs and hooks and all that. Um, Preeti sends in a question. She says, "What was the difference in cost between using regular sized, readily available bricks and making your own bricks? If making your own was more expensive, how do you convince the client of its value?" Same for the oxide marble flooring that you said was a labor-intensive effort. Um, uh, yeah. So the brick, uh, um, the brick cost was not very different. But then uh, um, what happened was the size, the custom size we made, the bricks broke a lot. So the wastage in like a usual brick would be about five percent, uh, but the ones we made were uh, probably I think about. 40 45% because they just broke uh, so we had to use them as like uh, in fill or like in some other places where we we like buy broken brick instead of that we had to use this but we had to get them at full price so that was one cost difference uh, but as as far as a brick cost is concerned per piece it was not too much it was almost uh, but yeah the wastage was very high because it was a new size and yeah. while handling transport and all that the bricks would just break mainly because like uh, the people handling and working just like their hand knowledge is just used to like a regular brick right so when suddenly there's a new size all of that sort of the sink and everything changes and also i think this yeah. made it break quite a bit yeah yeah and then as as far as the mosaic thing is concerned, uh, there also the uh, uh, the labor cost was the same, but then there was like material cost was uh, pretty much nil because we didn't have to buy any material, it was just cement. So the client was okay with it. Otherwise, the client wouldn't agree to. If the cost is more, it's it's like very hard to convince. So uh, we did this, and then we said there'll be like no extra material except for the cement, which was not too expensive. And the labor they had, is, which is pretty much the laying cost, a little more than the regular laying cost, so it's fine. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Ajit sends in a question saying, time spent on design versus detailing, vis-a-vis uh, -vis fees, how do you manage the maths? <laughs> they actually kind of, uh, for us till now, it's not related. So we just tell a fee and then after that, it's just like uh, if the client can take more, then we just keep designing because we like doing that, the detail. Uh, uh, Having said uh, that, we haven't really streamlined this as much as we should be. Okay. Yeah, so we, we first started the design. So once that's all in place, then we start thinking about what else we can add or how to make the make thing. Mm -hmm. All the smaller details comes in after that. We don't start with the detail and then the design. First, the overall thing is done, and then uh, once we are happy with that, then we start the smaller things as work starts inside. Yeah, and if you're talking about the handles and things like that, those are the things that are happening parallelly anyway. Um, yeah. So uh, that would happen irrespective of whether we have a project or not. So hmm. that would just mean including those things if it allows into our projects as well. Hmm. When 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 we started, that was not the case. Uh, yeah. But now yeah. it is. Yeah. Now we have made it like that because we also like doing that. So now we made it. Like that. Before it was just for the product. Uh, uh, sorry, just for the project. But then we thought because that takes a lot of time to come up with something like that. Then we thought, uh, if you're spending so much time anyway on something, then we should just uh, see if it can be like workable on a larger scale. Mm -hmm. I think uh, the next question we've got is from Bavesh. It's a long question. It says, what kinds of difficulties do you face when explaining alternate technologies to clients? Do you feel that the client can be taken out of the architectural paradigm as the gap between the architect and client poses challenges on many fronts, sometimes great challenges that many lead to innovations, but most of the time it may totally damage the architect's vision altogether. What's your take on that? How can you escape that? And um, I don't understand the last bit, but uh, make it independent of 
made if you feel escape is a better route um i launched the first part cuz i i'm not i'm not following the second yeah no do i sorry i couldn't simplify um, it so the thing is uh one it helped that art lab was our first project so most of our client meetings happen in the studio so when they sort of enter this space they know the sort of aesthetics material and the results as well like they know if they use if they use something like this this is how the space is going to look and so that i think helps and a lot of clients who come and see the studio and also run away saying these guys are not for us as well so in both ways i guess it helps in at least screening the second thing i think is when your uh, most clients do not come from design backgrounds and they don't have to either so i think while talking to them you i mean we can talk about design and space and light and how the space is going to enhance their lives and all of that but i think uh, talking to them in their language would help them and us uh, talking to them in terms of like functionality or cost or you know those kind of parameters that they may be able to understand better always helps in putting your point forward and also understand also asking them the issues they have currently with either their workspace or their house or you know anything that they if they want to build something if they've already lived or used something like that ask them what the issues are and uh talk about design in a way as solving those sort of issues i think um yeah so i think that would sort of help in and of course if none of it is working with the client is argument obviously like design changing so you also have to be open to a certain extent to not be fixated on what you think the client must have as well so i think these are some of the things that we uh keep in mind when you're talking to a client about our design uh talking to them in their parameters karthik you want to add something um yeah i think that that's that's pretty much yeah and the second part i'm not sure what, what yeah. yeah sorry i i don't yeah. follow it very well yeah. so no i can't uh, put it in better words bavish if you are no listening problem. and if you want to send it again that would be great uh deeksha uh, sends you a question she says very impressive work inspirational i want to know if there's anything you'd wish an architecture student should focus on what do you expect from a portfolio and please make it and how does one make it spec uh, specifically for your firm and some generalized tips also please you <laughs> no there's like nothing specific that we're looking for in a uh uh no only thing we're looking for in a portfolio is um we just want to see how interested they are if the interest shows in that in like any field then you know it be not something specific if they are, as in if they should have fun doing what they doing if that comes across then that 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 then it's yeah that's how we have a team where uh mostly it's a bunch of people who who like what they're doing but they don't know what they're doing <laughs> yeah um you have a question from venkatesh who says how do you uh, convince your clients with your details do they really understand the time invested in customizing even the smallest of details for instance door knobs skirting etc how do you educate them um mostly there is no discussion with the client about all yeah, this <laughs> <laughs> we just think is this we done the we just we unless it has overshare too much about clients. yeah too much cost implication or anything like that if it's not too much of that and we know it's like within the budget and all that then we don't tell the client. yeah so we just do it <laughs> Okay. Also, uh, don't know how much a client really needs to understand every minute detail. I think once the client starts using the space, they understand better. But for them to understand from a drawing is a slightly unfair thing for us or for us. So yeah. you can like not overshare actually. Just uh, tell what's relevant and leave it at that and do your. I don't know. It's like good at all. That's what we do. 
I think Simran also had a question. Simran, do you want to speak? Uh, do you want to share your question? Um, sure, ma'am. Thank you. And uh, so my question is a more of a general question. So uh, being such a young firm comes with its own set of challenges and rewards, of course. So most of us can understand, you know, the challenging aspect, convincing clients, costing, work on site. But apart from seeing your design come to life, what are some of the most um, rewarding experiences that you have being such a young practice and such young individual? I'd like, okay, so I think the most rewarding and the fun part of this is because there's a very small group, we're all like friends hanging out and working, which is always a lot of fun. And even if there's any sort of conflict, it gets resolved very easily because we're friends ultimately. And even with clients, a lot of them come word of mouth or through friends and uh, the conversation initially starts to become easy. But now there are, of course, clients coming from other places, but initially that part I found a lot of fun. Um, apart from that, like the working part of it, I think it's, uh, I, we don't intend to stay a small practice for too long. Actually, do we intend to stay a small practice for too long? I think. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah. I think as of now, it's giving us enough uh, leeway to sort of experiment all of these things and to focus on design and all of that. So, so it, yeah, it's. Uh, we have yeah. a question from uh, Tejas. Uh, yeah. Have you ever dropped a project midway due to clients overstepping their boundaries? Yeah, we have. <laughs> but then it was, uh, we, 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 we told them it was not um, like from the beginning, we were asking them it will be okay, it will be okay. They were okay, and then midway, like almost none of our designs were getting done there. Um, and then we like told them, then it's better they continue. So we like uh, we like made sure the the project can finish, but with uh, without our inputs anymore. Like whatever we had done, so we had the people given to them. Uh, yeah, and then they just finished it. Because anyway, they uh, they were handling that. But there was just one project, I think. In the back. Because they didn't understand uh, uh, what we were do, trying to do. And, yeah. But yeah, but, but it did not get into a place where we like abandoned the project. Uh, we still made sure the project is over. Uh, and and the clients are happy about it, but just not our design. <laughs> like still our design, but won't look like as in the basic structure, the basic oh, framework of was ours. Yeah. yeah, we just gave whatever like the shell or something, and then after they could yeah they, yeah. they didn't need and us anymore. So till that stage, we gave the design. Correct. And like, all the materials used and all that they wanted to choose tiles and which were not of our liking so then we said okay then these are the people you you can get the tiles from these places you, you choose whatever you want and you finish the project really wonderful work uh, Preeti and Karthik thank you so much for sharing your work and also thank your you. approach uh, to architecture. We wish you the very, very best and look forward to seeing more wonderful work from your studio. Um, thank you. Hope the listeners, thank you to the listeners and hope you all will tune in again next Friday to this webinar and we hope to have another wonderful speaker sharing their work. Thank you so much. Have a great evening. Thank you.